Friday afternoon was warm, sunny, and brilliant, below a cloudlessly blue New Mexico sky. But if this had been a movie, it would have been raining. Our family had a dog named Flash. She was part of our lives for nearly 14 years. She slept in our bedroom, walked with us every day, went on every trip we took, hiked, and even skied, with us trying to freeload by standing on the back of our skis. She never boarded in a kennel a day in her life. Almost my first action every morning was to serve her breakfast, and almost the last of our day to put her outside and then bring her back in. When we camped, she slept in the tent on our legs. She protected us from bears and mountain lions and immigrants jogging across the border from Mexico as we lay unprotected on the open ground. She was, simply, a part of our lives, a life within our lives. Two weeks ago, she started to fail. She could hardly walk, she was in pain, she could never get comfortable. She lost interest in eating and almost everything else. We took her to the vet who had cared for her all her life, and she gave us steroid pills to relieve pain caused by calcification of her spine. After a day's surcease, Flash relapsed and became worse. Friday afternoon, under the New Mexico sun, my wife, my son, and I took her back to the vet for the last time. They had prepared a room for us with a comfortable mat for Flash, low lights, peace, and privacy. The vet, Barbara, gave Flash an injection to relax her, and then, ten minutes later, a large dose of an anesthetic. As we held and caressed her, she relaxed completely for the first time in ten days. A minute later, she stopped breathing. It was death with dignity. Go gentle into that good night. These were the words my wife and I both misquoted from Dial and Thomas. We drove home, somber, sad, shedding a few tears. We packed her up her food and other things and gave them to a friend. We didn't talk much. We were drained emotionally as well as physically. But I was restless. As the sun slipped toward the mountain ridge to the west, I went for a walk in the forest. For nearly 14 years, Flash would have accompanied me. Now I was alone. I headed for a place we informally call Sunset Rock, where there was a beautiful view from the edge of a ravine across a vista of mountains and woods. But the Forest Service had deliberately allowed the trail to disintegrate and I could no longer find it. Had Flash been with me, she would, I believe, have led me there. As I walked, I cried. Not a few seeping tears as earlier, but a bawling, full-throated scream of pain. I yelled and I cursed. I could not get out of my head other words from the same Thomas poem. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I raged alone in the woods, as I still do achingly as I write this. But what is this rage? Flash had a good, full, and long life, and a peaceful, dignified, painless death. What more could I wish for any being? And then I realized that my mourning, like much mourning, was selfish. I was mourning for myself, for the gaping hole left in my life by the death of a living being that I loved and who helped fill my life with good things. But I realized too that in the morning I was also honoring Flash, honoring what she had meant to me, what she had contributed to the world of which I was a part. And finally I realized that this thought too was accompanying my mourning for Flash. The society in which I live will do all in its power to prevent me, when my time comes, from having a death as dignified, loving, serene, and humane as the one we gave Flash. For, strange as it sounds, 
our parting gift to her was in the way of her death. Depending on your time frame, this is a story of justice or injustice. Either way, I was the subject and it left an indelible impression on me about how our criminal system works and fails to work. The story began some years ago when I was driving blithely down Highway 14 near my house and fell into a speed trap set by a Bernalillo County Deputy Sheriff. He informed me I was going, as I recall, 11 miles over the speed limit. He returned to his patrol car with my license and registration and made the usual computer check. Writing up the ticket seemed to take a long time, and I fidgeted restlessly as I was late for an appointment. Finally, he returned to my car and told me to get out and put my hands on the car roof. Without another word, he handcuffed my arms behind my back and searched me. He then told me I was under arrest. Why? There's a warrant out for your arrest. For what? Failure to appear in court. On what charge? A traffic citation. When? Three years ago. So I had to leave my car parked on the shoulder of the road and my appointment wondering where I was. I climbed into the back seat of the cruiser with my handcuffs, with my hands still cuffed and headed for the jail in Albuquerque. There, I was booked in, made to wait in a caged cubicle with several other similar unfortunates, and finally allowed to bond out. The whole procedure took half a day. Fortunately, I had saved the original papers from the first traffic citation. It too had been for speeding. But I had gone to court for the appointed trial date, I had pleaded innocent, and the speeding charge had been, dis been dismissed by the judge. How could an arrest warrant be issued for an appearance I had made in court on a charge that had been dismissed? Enter the world of criminal justice. The judge in the case was Charles R. Barnhart of Metropolitan Court in Albuquerque. When I later returned to his courtroom to protest his issuing an arrest warrant for non-appearance on a charge that he himself had dismissed, the judge abruptly dismissed the whole thing, new charge, old charge, arrest warrant, everything. What had happened, he said, unapologetically, was what he had forgotten he, to know, was that he had forgotten to notify the clerk's office that he had dismissed the original charge. End of case. I tried to put the embarrassing, humiliating, and stressful incident out of my mind. After all, many of my journalistic colleagues have had to endure far worse at the hands of the law. I had no right to make a big deal out of something so patently ridiculous. So it all slipped into the back of my mind until a few days ago when I ran across a startling press release from the New Mexico Judicial Standards Commission dated July 29th. The commission had launched an ethics investigation of this same Judge Barnhart and to avoid a trial the good judge had admitted guilt to nine offenses and accepted punishment that included, quote, mandatory retirement, unquote. A fine of $1,000, a formal reprimand, and, quote, prohibition against ever holding judicial office again, unquote. One of the nine counts he pleaded guilty to was some peculiar behavior on, quote, at a minimum 233 cases, unquote, in which bench warrants were issued. But that was not all. During a domestic violence arraignment last year, the defendant waited to plead guilty. The judge wanted to know why and then asked, well, did you have it coming? And laughed out loud. Other charges he pleaded guilty to included, quote, willfully and knowingly violating state law on probation cases and refusing to issue, quote, legitimate, unquote, bench warrants. He admitted he had threatened the court security officer with loss of his job, engaged in, quote, a pattern of hostile conduct toward court security officers and court employees, unquote, and doing some disagreement with court officials, quote, tossed objects, yelled, and pounded his fist on the desk, unquote. In his summary of the disciplining of the judge, James A. Noel, executive director of the Judicial Standards Commission, said, quote, the evidence compiled by the examiner in the case against Judge Barnhart 
demonstrated an incredible record of intentional and willful disregard of court policies and procedures and the law, and a marked disrespect for his colleagues and co-workers. It is clear from his actions that Judge Barnhart took every opportunity to undermine the authority of the chief judge and the presiding criminal, criminal judge, the examiner continued. This defiant attitude carried over to Judge Barnhart's interaction with the commission where he exhibited a shocking indifference to the commission's authority and proceedings, unquote. In this case, at least, I would say that justice delayed was still justice. After all these years, I felt a smidgen better. <laughs>